Yes, I've been told I've got this post-viral fatigue, um, which I'm using extensively to get out of the washing up, <laughs> primarily, and, and uh, other household chores. <laughs> Nehemiah, chapter 2. Um, and just before I read it, it is, uh, of course, a delight to be preaching just after a week of prayer and fasting. And before I get into Nehemiah, I just want to mention again Steve Tibbet, the rather nervous-looking character that appeared on the screen with his lovely wife, Deb. So as Joe said, Steve leads what's called the Together Team of New Frontiers Apostolic Ministries, of which Advance is, of course, a part. And some of you have been asking, particularly through our Focus Day, and all the, you know, are we Advance? Are we New Frontiers? Are they connected? How does that kind of work together? So I thought I would try and give a brief explanation before we get into the text. Uh, in terms of a kind of family tree, I suppose, I think that would, that would help. Back in the 70s and the 80s, uh, when there was a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit, several Christian leaders began to see that although a personal experience of the Holy Spirit was really important and wonderful, actually what was needed was the restoration of the church itself, not only the individual. And the restoration of the church to New Testament principles and practices was the key, actually, to worldwide evangelism and sustainable mission, the planting of churches. And that led to further study of the New Testament. How does the church grow in size? How does the church come to maturity across the nations, and of course the answer is in Ephesians chapter 4, where we're told that God gives gifts to the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers, given by God to equip the saints for works of service to bring the church to maturity and fullness. And Terry Virgo was one of those leaders who was planting these new, what were then called, house churches, and was then overseeing and advising lots of these little house churches in terms of what New Testament church life should look like. There was a definite break from the kind of institutional church of that period <clears throat> to a kind of inspirational Holy Spirit filled, you know, based on the New Testament, what should the church look like? And he began to gather an Ephesians 4 team of these various gifts to help serve these new church groups that were springing up as a result of his ministry. Over a 40-year period, that ministry became known as New Frontiers, with over a 1,000 churches, and now there are 2,000, but then with over a 1,000 churches around the world. And while Terry continued to lead that Ephesians 4 team, in fact, other teams were emerging as well in India and in the USA and in Mexico, all kind of part of the New Frontiers family of churches that were together on a mission to bring Christ to the nations. And then in the 2000s, whichever year it was, Terry decided to publicly recognize emerging or potentially emerging apostolic team leaders. This happened at a conference in Brighton. And New Frontiers gave birth to, this is where the family tree image comes in, a number of apostolic spheres led by recognized apostles. Now they called them spheres because Paul had said, I hope to go beyond you so that my sphere of influence would increase. So there's a kind of apostolic sphere. It's not really about orbs, but, but there was a sphere of influence. And so this term spheres kind of picked up. It's not a personality-driven thing. It's an Ephesians 4 gift-driven thing. In fact, it's driven by the leadership of apostolic gifts. So regions beyond is a sphere led by Steve Oliver, who was originally part of Jubilee. New Ground is a sphere led by Dave Holden. Commission India with over 200 churches is led by Vinu Paul. Disciple Nations led by Scott Marks. And there are others. And each so-called sphere is led by a recognized apostle. And Advance was the sphere founded and led by P.J. Smythe. 
So think of it as a family tree. There's Terry's apostolic team, which after 40 years of fruitful ministry gave birth to multiple apostolic teams, of which Advance was one. So it's not, are we in Advance or are we in New Frontiers? Advance is one of the sister spheres, if you like, birthed out of New Frontiers. But they're all ours. You know, we're part of a a much bigger, if you like, apostolic fellowship across the board. So, of course, it's good to pray for the advanced team at the moment because the apostolic, the designated apostolic gift, PJ Smythe, no longer leads that team. And it's also a key moment for other New Frontiers Ephesians 4 gifts to serve, to support, particularly those churches with, within advance, with a shorter or even non-existent history within the wider New Frontiers family. And that's actually what's happening, and it's a, it's a good thing. And then, this is where Steve Tibbet comes in, over those spheres, as Joe said, is a kind of, I don't know if he'd like this description, but a kind of non-authoritative together team that coordinates how these different Teams can work together, support each other, put on kind of joint events to make a bigger impact in a region or break into a new uh, country, perhaps with church planting initiatives, working together and so on. So it's called a together team, um, which is about being in and out of each other's spheres and ministries, sharing resources, moving forward in an apostolic fellowship. And Steve Tibbet leads that team, as well as, Joe said, the 1,700-person strong King's Church London, a church that I love very much. And so we've asked Steve next week to give us a kind of a big picture view of what's happening across our sister spheres. Uh, Obviously, we're aware of what's happening in advance, but we want to hear what's happening in the sister spheres across New Frontiers. And our own family history as Jubilee continues to be, we've not moved about the restoration of the church to New Testament patterns of practice and faith and action and power for the blessing of the nations and for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. Does that help? Does that kind of, you can see kind of where it fits together. So they're not kind of, we're not kind of out here on our own. So to Nehemiah then. Chapter 2, can you get there if you've got your Bible? It's following the prophecies of Jeremiah and Daniel and Ezekiel, the people began returning from exile in Babylon to regather (coughs) in Jerusalem. And as predicted, it was about 70 years, which I think made up for all the Sabbaths that had been missed for the land. Although uh, they did return somewhat in dribs and drabs. They didn't all come at one time. The Babylonian Empire, of course, as you heard last week, has now fallen to the Persians. Artaxerxes has already given permission for Ezra. By the time we open Nehemiah, if you read the book of Ezra as well, he's given permission for Ezra to start restoring the temple. Haggai and um, uh, Zechariah are prophesying. And Ezra begins to instruct the people, but Jerusalem is still vulnerable. The walls are broken down, and that's when Nehemiah enters the story. So the books of Ezra and Nehemiah really belong together, uh, and they represent the restoration of the people of God to the presence of God in the city of God. It's a a wonderful picture of the restoration of the church, and, and their story, of course, speaks to us Today, I've got three points, the need to rebuild, the need for plurality, and the joy of regathering. So first of all then, the need to rebuild. Last week, we saw how Nehemiah hears the city's in ruins, the city wall is still in ruins, the great wooden gates uh, at various points around what would be actually quite a small city wall compared to the size of Jerusalem today, of course. But they've not been repaired. It's been over 70 years since the destruction took place, and it's still a mess. 70 years. It's just over 76 years ago that World War II ended. So it's the kind of time period we're looking at. So if you can remember photographs, aerial photographs of London or of Berlin, or of Rotterdam. You know, it's like going there today and and finding that they're still in ruins. My aunt 
Ivy one morning uh, lived in London and she came up out of the underground. They were using the underground as um, uh, air raid shelters. Came up, went back to her home. Houses all there. One house completely disappeared. Her house was completely demolished. It's, it's, it's like going back to London today and still seeing it in, in ruins. And, and Nehemiah weeps and he prays and fasts over a period of about four months. It's quite a long, not just a week. I mean, a week is good. Um, let's read from chapter two. And I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible, which I'm just kind of enjoying reading at the moment. During the month of Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was set before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. So he's doing something perhaps a little more personal than he would have done normally. I'd never been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, why do you look so sad when you aren't sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. I was overwhelmed with fear (coughs) and replied to the king, may the king live forever. Why should I not be sad when the the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And then the king asked me, what is your request? So I prayed. He's prayed for four months, remember. He prays this little silent prayer. So I prayed to the God of the heavens and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor with you, send me to Judah and to the city where my ancestors are buried so that I may rebuild it. The king with the queen seated beside him asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you return? So I gave him a definite time. So Nehemiah is a great administrator. He's actually already thought through a timeline for the rebuild. Or he's a guesstimate. He hasn't inspected the walls yet, but he's clearly thinking ahead. So I gave him a definite time and it pleased the king to send me. He doesn't, just doesn't leave it there. Listen to this. I also said to the king, and uh, if it pleases the king, let me have letters written to the governors of the region west of the Euphrates River so that they will grant me safe passage until I reach Judah. And let me have a letter written to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so that he will give me timber to rebuild the gates of the temple's fortress, the city wall, and the home where I'll live. Amazing. So he's really going, and I need some resources, king. The king granted my requests. Wow! For the gracious hand of my God was on me. Oh, come on. Are there things you're looking to God for? Is the gracious hand of God on you? You, well, make your requests. I went to the governors of the region west of the Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king also sent officers of the... He's got, he's got an armed guard with him. He's got an infantry, a cavalry. The, the king also sent officers of the infantry and cavalry with me. When San, now, now, this is where the music changes. Um, da-dum, 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 da-dum. Sanballat, the Horonites, and Tobiah, the Ammonite. They're the baddies. Uh, When they heard that someone had come to pursue the prosperity of the Israelites, they were greatly displeased. He just sows that little seed. There's trouble as well. After I arrived in Jerusalem and had been there three days, I got up at night and took a few men with me. I didn't tell anyone what my God had laid on my heart to do for Jerusalem. The only animal, in case you're concerned about animals, that I took was the one I was riding. I went out at night through the valley gate towards the serpent's well and the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down and the gates that had been destroyed by fire. I went on <coughs> to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but farther down, <coughs> excuse me, it became too narrow for my animal to go through. So I went up at night by way of the valley and inspected the wall. And then heading back, I entered through the valley gate and returned. The official did, the officials did not know where I'd gone or what I was doing, for I'd not yet told the Jews, priests, nobles, officials, or the rest of them who would be doing the work. So I said to them, you see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned. Come, let's rebuild Jerusalem's wall so that we will no longer be a disgrace. And I told them how the gracious hand of my God had been on me and what the king had said to me. And they said, let's start rebuilding. And their hands were strengthened to do this good work. When Sambalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about this, they mocked and despised us and said, what is this you are doing? 
Are you rebelling against the king? I gave him this reply. The God of the heavens is the one who will grant us success. We, his servants, will start building, but you have no share, right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. Amen. So, <coughs> Nehemiah prays. I, I've got water. Oh, look, come, 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 come. Thank you. A cup of cold water. You will not lose your reward. You sure that's not gin? So, so Nehemiah fasts, he prays before he does anything practical, which I think we've learned from this week. He goes into the secret place. He prays to his father who sees in secret. He prays and fasts over a period of four months until a key moment presents itself before the king and the queen together. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Don't you think? When a man with a responsible, secure, secular job gets a burden to help build the church of God. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That's what's happening here. This guy is secure. The, guy, the, the folks in, in Jerusalem are struggling. There is, there are, there's a good, much more, many, many more people who are in Babylon who've now got jobs and they've got houses and it's secure and there's infrastructure, whereas there's practically nothing in Jerusalem. It's not like a, wow, let's go to Jerusalem. It's like there's tons of stuff there. It's not like an attractive city over there. But this guy gets a burden to build the church of God. And, and in the midst of his own personal success, he's seeking the success of the kingdom of God. Maybe you're a Nehemiah. He actually leaves his job for a season. I'm not saying you should do this, but he actually leaves his job for a season in order to restore the city of God. It's, it's just an amazing thing. And don't think he's just a butler like you've read in your children's Bibles. He holds a high position in the court of Artaxerxes. And Artaxerxes is, of course, the son of Xerxes. You've met Xerxes before. In Hebrew, he's known as Ahasuerus. Now, that may not ring a bell either, but you've encountered Ahasuerus before because his first wife was called Queen Vashti. Ah, yes. And remember, Queen Vashti embarrassed him publicly, and so she was replaced by Esther. So Artaxerxes is actually Esther's stepson. And I think at a human level, that helps explain why he's so positive about sending Ezra back to you know, begin worship again in the ruins of the temple and restoring the temple. And it also explains why he's so kind of over-the-top generous towards Nehemiah as well. And Nehemiah is not a pastor. He's not a priestly leader as such. Robert Alter, in his commentary on the Hebrew Bible, that he's, the Hebrew Scriptures that he's just recently translated and published, says this, coming to Jerusalem from a high position in the Persian court, he is the political leader who addresses security issues of rebuilding the walls of the city and confronting armed enemies. And so together, these two gifted leaders, Ezra and Nehemiah, create a safe environment where people can gather, where worship is re-established, and Scripture is restored as the authoritative guide for the people of God. Now, the COVID season has been odd, hasn't it? Very strange. It's drawn us apart. We've used video, maybe you're at home watching this or fast forwarding through it, as the case may be. We, we've, we've had to use video. We've tried to make the church kind of happen at home. Um, but at some point, that will end. That has to end. Church at home was a grace to us, but the church is a community, as it is now, and belongs together in the presence of God, experiencing the gifts of the Holy Spirit as Christ is preached and as non-believers come and hear of a Jesus who is a friend of sinners and who loves them and believe in him. So the need to regather and to rebuild is obvious. Isolation isn't healthy. The lack of assembling together was temporary, 
because we're on a mission to reach our city and our neighbours with the gospel. And we need to rebuild for that end with fresh creativity and with fresh energy. Amen? So that's the need to rebuild. Secondly, we see the need for plurality. A key to understanding this restoration story is plurality at every level. Not only chapter 3, as we'll see next week, amongst the people, all of them engaging in building the wall, but at leadership level as well, there is plurality. Verse 11, I got up at night and I took a few men with me. That's the first little indication that Nehemiah is not trying to do this as a superman on his own. After the inspection, he gathers then more. He gathers the officials, the leaders, the priests, those, he says, who would be doing the work. They didn't know this but at the time, but he knew it. They would be doing the work. And he forms a team. And that's what's meant by plurality. It's not individuality, although individuals are important. It's plurality. There's a, there's a group of people working together in leadership. So individual leadership faith is definitely important. But just look at the plurality of the leadership here. You've got Nehemiah kind of inspiring and activating the people. Then you've got Ezra preaching the word and giving the sense of it, it says in the book of Ezra. And then you've got tons of musicians and singers. There's, a, there's an over-the-top number of musicians and singers who return. There are more musicians than builders because the worship experience in the temple in the Old Testament was a big deal with cymbals and trumpets and harps and, you know, it's a huge thing. In addition to Nehemiah, you've got Haggai, as I said already, and Zechariah. They've already been prophesying about the importance of temple worship. Plurality of leadership is everywhere. And we need many gifts in order to build something that's safe and that's sustainable. And Ephesians chapter 4 mentions numerous gifts. We're not just after an executive board. We need gifted Holy Spirit anointed apostles, prophets, where are the prophets? Evangelists, where are the evangelists? And pastor teachers who have been called and anointed by God and can equip the church for works of service. So plurality is key, both in this story and in the story of the building of the New Testament city of God. Plurality is a tremendous safeguard against error and imbalance and abuse of power. And I'm not downplaying gift. The church needs faith-filled, bold leadership gifts. But that should never be at the expense of genuine plurality. And that's why in the New Testament, you see there are elders leading churches. Again and again and again, every church, every epistle, all through the book of Acts, Strictly speaking, there's no lead elder figure recognized in any of the New Testament churches or in any of the epistles in the New Testament. Paul doesn't call for the lead elder in Ephesus. He calls for the elders. The leaders who are named in the epistles and in the book of Acts tend to be those on apostolic teams who are itinerating among the churches, not the permanently settled elders. The only hint I could think of, you may have one, of a first elder is John's criticism of Diotrephes, who he says loves to be first among them, 3 John 1, 9. Now, having said that, we believe in leadership. We believe in captaincy as a pragmatic means to make our togetherness function easily. We're not against the idea of actually a lead elder. Every sports team has a captain. But the actual authority invested in a group of elders keeps the church safe, as opposed to the CEO style of pastor who hires and fires and who is a big dog leader who can do untold damage to the cause of Christ. And it's something that we've seen in the global church over the last few decades. Not long after I was converted in the 80s, boom, on the news comes 
some American preacher I'd never heard of has got a massive church and, and it's just been like decade after decade of my Christian life, there have been accounts of guys who just looked really brilliant and just blowing up. And it's like, no, no, we need eldership. We need plurality. It's a safeguard. God has given it to us in the New Testament as how the church will be safely built and sustained. And we'll see actually next week how in chapter 3, Every household had a part to play. So it wasn't just plurality in the, in the leadership, as it were, in Nehemiah's story. It was plurality in, in everyone. I mean, I'm not sure I would have wanted to have been built, building the dung gate. I think it was kind of a, one of the priests who lived near the dung gate. They needed to rebuild that as well. Um, all the people were involved in building together, and that meant that something amazing was built. And so what we're doing here in restoring the church is establishing beacons of light in the darkness. We're joining together with Christ who said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We're called to be witnesses together, to be salt and light set on a hill. And therefore together we give of our time, our resources, our gifts in order to glorify God. It's impossible to build with just one or two gifts engaged. It's, it's not good if a small number of servant-hearted people are carrying a large bulk of the work. We're one body made up of numerous parts and we need to find ways of bringing our gifts together to build Christ's glorious church. Amen? So the need to rebuild, the need for plurality, and then finally, the joy and the challenges of regathering. There's opposition, as we've seen. Sambalat and Tobias. In verse 19, they say, what are you doing? You know, and all the way through the story, it's who do you think you are? You're rebellious later on. What you're building is flimsy. It could fall apart so easily. Look how weak it is. Nehemiah had these two troublemakers, you know, that dogged his steps all along the way. They're following him around and they're trying to undermine him. And we can feel discouraged too. You're trying to build something for God. You're trying to build a family. You're trying to build a business. You're trying to just get through. And there's discouragement. There's Sambalat and Tobias at your heels. Just remember this. You've also got another two characters following you all the days of your life, Psalm 23, and that is goodness and loving kindness. The Bible says goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. So I'm not going to listen to Sambalat and Tobias. I'm going to say goodness and loving kindness are following me all the days of my life. And even into eternity, I'll be in the house of God. It's true. You should take that scripture and, and preach it at your troubles and at your worries and at your fears. Jesus answered temptation by quoting scripture. It is written. Nehemiah gives us a great verse here in 2.20. The God of heaven will make us successful. The God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. And as they start the work, the people regather, they rebuild, <coughs> and they start rejoicing. Because joy is the outcome when people experience the presence of God. There's much joy in the city when people experience the presence of God. And when the church is restored, is being restored, she experienced what Paul calls foretastes of heavenly glory. Do you know something about that? Foretastes of heavenly glory. And eventually, as we'll see, the leaders and the people complete the wall, overcoming the challenges. The scriptures are given center stage. That's the heart of any reformation. The Bible, once again, is restored as the authority for the people of God. Really, it's Jesus Christ being given the central place. And if we play our part, we'll see people regathering to the presence of God. What Nehemiah actually had was a foretaste, a foretaste of the heavenly city. Even what we experience now in the, in the true temple of God, the church, is merely a foretaste of the glory 
which is to come. When John in the book of Revelation says, he then carried me away in the spirit and showed me the holy city. That's the city we're really going. That's the city we're really moving towards, whose maker and whose builder is God. That's the city. Nehemiah city, the city, as it were, of the church, we get foretastes of the heavenly city. He showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed in God's glory. We're not engaged in forming a little club or preserving a little religion. We're about a great work. We're investing in what Jesus is building, the one thing that he's building. We are building and making something for God, which will be a blessing for those who don't yet believe, but who will come and find security and salvation in God's presence. And we're building something, we're investing in something that will last through that thin veil that separates time from eternity and will be forever established as the city of God, the church in all her glory, the bride of Christ. And Carl reminded us, reminded us last week that Nehemiah wept over Jerusalem, but Jesus also wept over Jerusalem. And it's Jesus who hung and died on a cross for our sins because we're sinners. And he died for our sins and he rose from the dead and he's alive He's alive today. And he's able to rebuild your life wherever you're at. He's able to rebuild your life and then like a living stone, knit you together with other living stones into this living temple, into this city of God. Jesus can transform the broken places into something that can house the glory of God. It's an amazing thing. Here I am, a sinner. I turn in faith to Jesus Christ. I repent. And immediately, the Spirit of God knows. The Spirit of God believes in justification by faith and inhabits me immediately. What have I done? I've just said, I'm a sinner. And I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. And I believe you, Jesus, died for my sins. Please forgive me. Please come into my life. And the Holy Spirit says, I'm coming now. And he comes in and he lives in you. This is a transformation that is, it's unthinkable. Isn't it scandalous? Isn't it outrageous? And he lives in you. And suddenly then you're joined, you're knit together with brothers and sisters into this church which is, of course, is the dwelling place of God in the Spirit. It's a miraculous thing. It's not just these are principles to live your life. There's a Jesus right in the middle of it all. There's a, there's a Jesus who loves you, who's drawn you. There's a Holy Spirit who just invades your life. And then when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, it's, it's just an amazing thing. And then together we realise, we cry out, don't we? The Spirit within us witnesses that we're sons of the living God and we cry out, Abba, Father. This is a Trinitarian invasion of grace. That's what rebuilding is about really, isn't it? I mean, that's what rebuilding is really about. It's about you and I meeting with Him and loving Him and loving one another. And Christian, this is a call, this series is a call to build the church, to build a glorious church for Jesus Christ, to be enlisted into something, as many of you already are, that will last forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together and we we'll pray. Whew, glory. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> I did feel a little bit of energy rising there in me. Lord Jesus, we just want to say to you how thrilled we are at your amazing grace. Grace we don't deserve. Grace which is genuinely amazing. And Lord, while we are prone to making you know, mistakes and all of this, 
We want to reiterate our dependence not on ourselves, but on you. And we ask you to come into our hearts and our lives afresh. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not sure (coughs) where you stand really with God. There are broken down places in your life and you need God. You need God. Maybe today, even for the first time, you're saying, I I want to put my trust in Jesus. I've heard the message before. I've been to church, but I want Jesus to come into my life right now. And maybe that's you. Maybe that's you. And if that's you, I want to pray a quick prayer for you before we go so that you can actually surrender yourself to Christ this morning. Is that okay? If that's you, (coughs) if that's you, then just pray after me. Lord Jesus, I offer to you the broken places in my life. And yet I know I'm a sinner. I've done wrong. I'm just going to change this prayer. I feel the Holy Spirit is leading me. I'm going to stop focusing on why that was broken, on who broke it down. I'm going to stop doing that. And I'm going to ask you, forgive me. Forgive me. And help me to forgive even as I've been forgiven. Lord, I want to surrender my self, my individuality to you.